All right. Now, look, we're, we're going to do uh, our usual rethink reviews with Jonathan Kim, of course. The, the movie is The Kids Are All Right. I need you to really watch and listen to this uh, review. We got some great facts, as we always do after the review. But actually, this was my favorite ending to your reviews oh, of all of them. Okay. Thank you. So I think this is really good. Let's watch. Laser, your mom and I sense that there's some other stuff going on in your life. We just want to be let in. What do you mean? Are you having a relationship with someone? You can tell us, honey. We would understand and support you. Look, I only met him once. What do you mean, once? Did he find you online? Wait, what? Wait, wait, who did you meet once? Paul. Paul, who's I met, Paul? I met him with Joni. Why was Joni there? She set it up. We forget the setup. Who's Paul? Our sperm donor. Did you guys think I was gay? No. No way. Well, of course not. In the case of Perry versus Schwarzenegger, which led to the recent overturning of California's anti-gay marriage law, Proposition 8, one of the defendant's main arguments was that banning gay marriage was all about protecting the children. After all, if children were exposed to a committed married gay couple, or even worse, were raised by one, these poor kids might catch the gay and would end up hopelessly damaged, deprived of the ineffable joys of having heterosexual parents. Unless, of course, they're among the close to 50% of children whose parents get divorced. The defendants could provide no real evidence proving the inherent superiority of straight parents over gay ones. So I'd be very curious to find out what they think of Lisa Cholodenko's new film, The Kids Are All Right about a lesbian couple and their two kids who have their world shaken when the kid's sperm donor enters their unconventional, yet often painfully conventional family. Annette Benning and Julianne Moore play Nick and Jules, a married couple living in a nice LA neighborhood raising their college-bound daughter Joni, played by Mia Wasikowska, and their 15-year-old son Laser, played by Josh Hutcherson. At Laser's urging, Joni uses her newly granted adult legal status to contact the donor whose sperm was used to impregnate their two moms. This turns out to be Paul, played by Mark Ruffalo, a free-spirited organic farmer and restaurateur and a character that very closely echoes Ruffalo's breakout debut performance as Laura Linney's ne'er-do-well younger brother in the must-see 2000 film You Can Count On Me. Paul's arrival upends the dynamic of the family as each member reacts differently to his laid-back bachelor charms, and their feelings shift further as Paul becomes more and more involved in their lives in both welcome and unwelcome ways. Basically, that's the story. Some have criticized The Kids Are All Right for not making louder, grander statements about gay marriage, but I personally appreciated the fact that this is a small, well-drawn story with realistic characters and relationships, not archetypes and symbolic, epic struggles. It's about teenagers trying to figure out who they are, adults trying to take responsibility for their lives and grow up, and the day-to-day -day struggles of a married couple and if they can protect their family and weather a major upheaval. In short, it's pretty similar to what every family goes through in one way or another. The family in The Kids Are All Right isn't better or worse than any other family, gay or straight. And no kids are forcibly turned gay, heterosexual couples remain intact, no one tries to marry their pets, and somehow, some way, the earth continues to repopulate itself, because the sexuality of parents couldn't possibly affect any of these things. Gay marriage haters, can you get that through your thick monkey skulls? And riddle me this, if you claim to be so worried about proper parenting and protecting children, why have you said nothing for decades about the fact that it's perfectly legal for murderers, rapists, child molesters, and genocidal dictators to marry and have children? The Menendez brothers and guys with nicknames like the Hillside Strangler, the Gainesville Ripper, and the Night Stalker all got married in jail. Ted Bundy even fathered a kid from behind bars. These are people we've stripped of practically all their rights, yet we don't take away their right to get married. Why not? Why should parents with children under 18 be allowed to get divorced when we know that divorce has such negative effects on kids? And of course, if you really want to protect the sanctity of marriage, why not outlaw divorce? Why not punish adultery as a crime? Why not ban reality show slave auctions like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, which make a mockery of the institution of marriage? And why not prevent multiple divorcees and adulterers like gay marriage opponents Rudy Giuliani and Newt Gingrich from ever getting married again, since they clearly don't hold marriage very sacred? Probably because it wouldn't be fair to take away someone's right to get married, regardless of what kind of person they are, which is my point exactly. I'm Jonathan Kim, and this is a Rethink Review. Nicely done, John. <laughs> I love that ending. Thanks. Now, it, it, not just the new Greg or Trudy Giuliani, but I, I had never seen anybody make the serial killer point before. Yeah, it is really strange when you think about it that that's considered a normal thing, and actually it's common for serial killers to be proposed to in jail by these strange women who obviously have problems, but happens all the time. Right, and you know, I, I use the Goslins as an example, like what can gay people do that the Goslins didn't do to marriage on TV? Right. But you're right, Bachelor and Bachelorette is a million times worse. 
all these people in the middle of the, you know, these evangelical Christians who are like, oh my God, out of these 28 men or women, which one are they going to choose for their life partner? That's not a mockery of marriage? Yeah, the idea you're that, choosing on a reality television show? Yeah, they put all these guys in the house. She goes on all these multiple dates with guys. And, and I don't know how long they shoot the show for, but what, a few months? Maybe? <laughs> yeah. So that's enough time that you can judge that you can marry someone for a lifetime after a few months on TV where the ulterior motive of people there for fame? Like, it's so obvious that they're using this as a wedge issue to divide us, to find an, an enemy and other to hate. It's And, you know, they always come back to the Bible, but, you know, so my question is, by the way, divorce is also in the Bible. What what does the Bible actually say about divorce? Uh, to quote God in Malachi chapter two verse sixteen, quote, "I hate divorce," says the Lord God of Israel. Uh, <laughs> that seems pretty clear. In, in, in Matthew nineteen six, so they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. But um, there are some exceptions in it in terms of like adultery and some other things. And although it's not that that God actually endorses this, but um, well, Jesus Jesus points out that these laws were given because of the hardness of people's hearts, not because they were God's desire. So it's like, well, people screw up, so I guess sometimes you have to have, you know you have to have divorce. But um, but one of the interesting things is that when there is divorce, there is remarrying allowed, but only the innocent party. So if a husband cheats on his wife, the husband can't get remarried, but the wife can get remarried. All right. Uh, of course, we follow none of these, right? right. <laughs> like, when's the last time you know you heard so somebody on television, like a Republican or anybody, saying, "No, no, we have to outlaw divorce," because God said it. He hates divorce. How much clearer could he be? Well, I think there should also be something maybe like you can get you can get divorced once, but then after that, you have to have civil unions. <laughs> you get de you get downgraded. You get That's the lesser one. That's another ones. really good idea, man. John's on fire. <laughs> okay, I like that. And then so Newt, once he does it again, will have to get you know a civil union for his fourth marriage. Yeah, exactly. Because you think he won't do it again? But remember, <laughs> we just did the story of his second wife, right? And his second wife came coming out and saying, you know, he was cheating with me uh, on his first wife, and then so I shouldn't have been surprised that he did it to me. That he was, you know, cheating on me with this, and then he brought her into our house and slept with her in our bed, right? Right. I mean, it was getting down and dirty. So, you think he won't do it a fourth time? And then also, I mean, in, in that article, that that Esquire article, um, she said, uh, his, uh, Mary, uh, Marianne Gingrich, he'd already asked her to marry him before he asked me for a divorce, before he even asked. That's yeah. hardcore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, <laughs> but that's a serious betrayal, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And and. But that's okay. But two people of the same sex saying we love each other and we want to grow together and you know we want to give to one another, that's disgusting. Yes. The big, que the big question is, which of Newt Gingrich's three marriages was the most sacred? Oh, God, man, this guy, somebody put him out, man. Put him <laughs> out. This guy's on fire here. <laughs> okay. See, that, that, I'm going to copy all four of those down. I'm getting excited here. All right. So, uh, look, look, John, let's be fair, though, okay? Uh, obviously, once gay people start getting married, divorce uh, picks up, right? I mean, the marriage starts to, you know, fall apart. The institution of marriage is destroyed, as the conservatives predicted, right? So, for example, Massachusetts, which has gay marriage, I'm sure has the highest rate of divorce in the whole country, right? Obviously, actually, abnormally low. In, in 2005, their divorce rate was 2.2, uh, 2.2 per 1,000 couples. Uh -huh. uh, Vermont was 3.3. Alabama, in the Bible-fearing South, 4.9. Mississippi, 4.5. Tennessee, 4.6. What happened? <laughs> what happened? I, I thought you guys protected the institution of marriage down in Alabama. Okay, no. Just, what, you're more than doubling Massachusetts' divorce rate. So should we outlaw straight marriage? Because you guys can't do it right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, that's it. How about parenting, though? Uh, you know, people are going to say, wait, look. Now, if you got gay parents, obviously the kid's going to turn out gay. <laughs> right. Does that turn out to be true? Uh, Try to make these softballs. I'm <laughs> turns out not to be true. The American Psychological Association, in their in a lengthy report, said that there's no there's no proof of that. Beliefs that lesbian and gay adults are not fit parents has no foundation. Lesbian heterosexual lesbian and heterosexual women have not been found to differ markedly in their approaches to child rearing. 
Um, but one of the more interesting, they, this, it's not quite substantiated, but they said the results of some studies suggest that lesbian mothers and gay fathers' parenting skills may be superior to those of matched heterosexual parents. Okay, now we're living out here. Okay, hold up, hold up. Okay. <laughs> Yesterday was. No, that's not it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, well, wh why are the gays' parenting superior? To well, well, what I think is interesting is the idea that if it say it's two men then they really are equals. It's not like if it's a man and a wife, like the, the man can say, well, the woman's supposed to do all the cooking or the woman's supposed to take care of the kids or do the cleaning, and I just go out and work. Whereas if it's two men, they'll decide amongst themselves, okay, well, which, you know, we'll figure it out for ourselves which works better. Totally not buying it. <laughs> is there a study? Is there some sort of proof? Or is it just some dude's theory? Well, I mean, th this is on the American Psychological Association's website, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually cite a study for that one, but it's saying it could be possible. Nah, get out of here. Now, I might be biased because I'm a straight parent, right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, all of a sudden, you think gay parents are going to do better than me? Hell no, right? <laughs> no, it just doesn't make sense to me, okay? I think that's getting carried away. But, uh, but of course, the rest of it is true, and you can't make stereotypes based on how people are going to do based on with their race or their sexual identity, et cetera. These are obvious to the, those of us without monkey skulls, as right. this guy would say. <laughs> All right, uh, John, so that's that, and that was great. Now I'm going to tell you a random Mark Ruffalo story. Go for it. Okay, so I'm uh, at a party, uh, and I don't know why I don't get invited to these anymore, probably because okay. of the story I'm about to tell you. Yeah. And uh, so back in the day when we were, you know, we'd get invited to these fancy schmancy lib celebrity parties every once in a while. You guys, you remember? Uh, sometimes we go. Anyway, we were at one at, uh, sh sh uh, what is it, the Chateau Maman right. in L.A., which is a famous place, right? And uh, Mark Ruffalo was there, Pierce Brosnan was there, a bunch of people was there. Who's the guy who did Crash? Uh, Gus Van? No. Figgis. Mike Figgis is the director. Okay. He's like a real bald guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, I went up to him. I'm like, hey, are you? Are you no, no, it's, it's not Figgis. No, 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 no. That's someone else. Sorry. No, it's... I should have had that prepared. I actually don't like him. But anyway. Okay, anyway, <laughs> he's a lib. I'll say. Okay. Anyway, so I went up to him, uh, and I'm like, are you like a blogger or something, like Huffington Post or something? Because I know you're from somewhere. He's like, no, not a big deal. I just directed Crash. That was the year that, that Crash won the Oscar. Uh -huh. like, oh, right, right, right. Paul Haggis? Is, no. That's that's right. Hi, Haggis, not Vegas. That's okay. right. Okay. All right, anyways. Uh, so Mark Ruffalo is in the middle of a conversation with Piers Brosnan. Okay, mm -hmm. and he's like, oh yeah, and, blah, blah. and this one, Pierce Brosnan is super hot. Mm -hmm. Okay, like his career is taken off. He's James Bond or whatever the hell he is, etc. And I, and I wanted to talk to Ruffalo, so Jank being Jank, I went up there and I'm like, hey Mark, Mark, hey man, hey what's up? Hey, come on, talk to me. So he starts talking to me for ten seconds, and and Brosnan's like, all right man, uh, I'll see you later. I'm gonna go. Oh. And you could see Ruffalo's face like. This son of a bitch trying to talk to me. When I was talking to Pierce Brosnan. I was Brosnan, talking to Remington Steele. How come he doesn't understand this? And you know Ruffalo's, like he, how he is in all the movies? Mm -hmm. Like that, like, that, like, quizzical look almost? Or well, he, in his better movies, he's like that. When he plays, like, a cop or something, it's like, no, come on, you're the slacker guy. Like, don't yeah, play a cop. Right, right. <laughs> like, he was giving me that slacker look like, oh, <sighs> dude. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing to me? And then he ran away. But I do recommend everyone that uh, that movie, You Can Count On Me, that was his, his uh, movie debut. The best movie about siblings I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. and it, Which usually is not a subject that's done well, but ex excellent in that one. All right, one last question for you, uh, now that we're uh, deep, knee deep in uh, movies. I, I missed uh, What the Flick today, right? Right. So I saw Eat, Pray, Love. I'm very curious. And I, what happened? So what did you guys give it? What did you, what did you give it? Um, I gave it like, I think it was a 6.3, I think. Yes. I mean, oh, okay. I, I, I said that like it's a chick flick that won't make guys want to kill themselves. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> because you were, you, were, you were eating and praying for death the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to do my own review later after the show. We'll put it up on uh, YouTube.com slash What The Flick Show. Okay, that's okay. where you can find all the What The Flick. So you can find John's review of it with Christy and Matt, and then I'll do my own. But so, what did Christy and Matt give it? Uh, let's see. I think. I mean, I think Roughly. in all, we averaged to like a six point five or oh, six really? or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I give you a quick preview of my review. I thought it lasted eight hours. <laughs> okay. So anyway, but we'll do that later. Uh, everybody, check out what the flick, which John is on. Of course, Rethink Reviews. That's on YouTube, Huffing the Post, RethinkReviews.net. Awesome review. Thank you, John. Oh, and, and one last thing. Next week, uh, The Tillman Story, a, a movie I've been very excited about for, for a long time, goes inside the Pat Tillman case and his, uh, his friendly fi death by friendly fire, which was lied about by everybody. All right. We'll look forward to that next Friday. Okay. Young Turks.